Hello everyone, today I am super excited about this topic because it is one that's just so dear and near to my heart and it is the Witcher series. If this is your first time here, you might not know, but I am actually Polish. Teraz mówię coś po polsku, żeby udowodnić wam, że faktycznie jestem z Polski. And the Witcher is also Polish and so it's just been so important in my education, forming my taste when it comes to fantasy. And over the past few years, we've really received a lot of Witcher content. And in lieu of getting the information that season four of the Witcher TV show on Netflix is starting to film, at least they had their first table read recently. I decided that it is time for me to rank the books, the video games, and the Witcher TV show seasons on Netflix. The first book is called The Last Wish, and to immediately dispel any sort of confusion, I don't know why the US and UK are marketing it as like a prequel. It's not, it is book one. If you don't read this book, it, it's like skipping the eye of the world in the wheel of time and jumping straight into the shadow rising. It, like you wouldn't do that because you would have no context of what the heck is going on. There are some short stories that ah, just get me every single time. For example, the fight with the Striga, the meeting of Yennefer and Geralt, and the never ending question of what was the last wish? What does he tell the djinn? And of course, you know, we meet Dandelion and I love Dandelion. It's nowhere near the best of what we've received, but I truly think it's, it sets the tone so well. And for that reason, I'm going to give it a solid B tier. Again, not the best, not the worst, but oh man, it's oh, so, so good. And I love it. I, I read it three times actually, um, once in English and twice in Polish and it's so good. Moving on to the sort of destiny, which I had the craziest roller coaster with because when I first read it, and I think I actually first read it in English. What did he say? I thought it was so much better than The Last Wish. Upon reread? Uh, it just doesn't hold up as well, I, I have to admit. There are still some banger moments, uh, more stuff with Yennefer and the Beltane sequence, which is just super iconic. And of course, we meet our dear darling, Cirilla. I hate child characters. Unless it's Stephen King, I tend to get really annoyed by children, not Siri. Oh, I love Siri so much. I won't get into it now, but I feel like what Netflix did with Siri really did her a disservice because man, the way she's introduced is just, it makes you as the reader care about her so much. And so when she becomes pretty much a co-lead towards the end of the series, you're not annoyed that she's taking the spotlight from Geralt. Like you're so proud of her for growing up and you fear for her when she, you know, goes through all these terrible things and you're just, you're just wanting her to be okay because you remember what she was like in these very first short stories. But the first half of the short stories after rereading them just don't really hold up. I actually discovered Bookborn through her Witcher videos. And for the longest time, I was so fired up against her because I was like, she doesn't know what she's talking about. But after reading the start of The Sword of Destiny, I was like, oh, I don't didn't remember that. But still, I don't think it's nearly as bad as she describes so and also the english translation it's not the best a lot is lost in terms of humor oh and the audiobooks are also awful so don't don't even bother uh anyways no hate to her love her videos she's a genius at video essays and you should totally check her out maybe her influence is actually why i noticed these things so for that reason i'm going to put the sword of destiny into c tier then we have book three which is blood of elves i think is the one that has the least plot um you do have a lot of very impactful individual moments but the stuff that he uses to connect them is usually mid. This is the book that Ciri trains with Geralt in Kaer Morhen. Uh, she also then trains with Yennefer towards the end. There's a very iconic moment in this elven ruin called Sherwood, and those moments are just brilliant. They're, they're truly brilliant. The stuff that connects them... I'm gonna put it bottom of B for now. Then we go to Time of Contempt, which is Lauren Hisrix, um, the showrunner for Witcher Netflix, her favorite book, though um, in my opinion she misunderstood 
quite a lot, but that's just my take. When I first read this book, I hated it. I thought it was trash, but upon rereading it, oh, my perspective was totally changed. Just It's just action after action after action, and there's so much political intrigue, and it all builds up this final showdown on the Thanid Isle. It's an event that is so brilliantly plotted out, and it's so impactful to every single character. I just, I loved, loved, loved the buildup. This is going to be my first A tier. And I just like to say, I am being very harsh on myself because I don't want to put everything into like A tier, you know, so. Then we get to the fan favorite book, which is Baptism of Fire. For context, I haven't reread the last three books of The Witcher, so my opinions might change, but this is what I think of right now. And Baptism of Fire was a huge standout to me, and it would have been my second favorite Witcher book, if not for my reread of Time of Contempt. Like, I was a hater. I don't know what happened to the Time of Contempt. Maybe, like, some fairy came in and was like, bop -de bop -de -de boop and just changed the entire book. For this reason, I'm going to put it into A tier, but behind Time of Contempt, because... <laughs> Wow. This is the one book in the entire series where Geralt is truly the only pretty much main character. Uh, a lot of people have this misconception that, oh, it's called The Witcher. Shouldn't it be about the Witcher doing witchery things? Not exactly. He's obviously like more the centerpiece in the short stories, but when we get into the actual novels, he does take a lot of a backseat and there's not nearly as much killing monsters. That being said, Baptism of Fire, that's purely Geralt. I think that's also a reason why it's so popular because it's, it's kind of the book that you expect to read while starting the series. Also, if you enjoy the found family trope, that's the one. Then we get to my favorite book, which my stupid co-worker stole from me. So I don't have it and I have to buy a new edition. And it's the Tower of the Swallow. It goes straight into S tier. By now we're far enough into the series where I can't say too much. This is the main series book. Some people don't like that. Again, I think if people don't like that, it's probably because they have this misconceived notion of what the series is supposed to be based on the dialogue that we are having and on social media. I think that this book is such an emotional center for us as the readers because we see Siri slowly start to grow up over the course of the series. And when we think back to how she was when we met her, and we see what she goes through in this book, it just, it just breaks your heart. Like, I worried for her so much, but I was so proud of her accomplishments as well. The visuals are stunning. And the final sequence, it takes place on this ice field. It is one of the most memorable things that I have ever read. Yeah, this book floored me. So it's definitely an S tier for me. And then we get to the final book and it's The Lady of the Lake. Maybe I'll have different thoughts on it when I reread it, um, but it is quite underwhelming when talking about the series as a whole. I still gave it a seven out of 10. So it's not a bad book by any means, it's just too long. It reads kind of like Blood of Elves, where once again you have very memorable sequences. So many characters have their final confrontations that are built up so well. And I think that the fact that it's just too long is its biggest downfall. Because in between those amazing moments, you just have so much filler. And for, th for that reason, I'm going to put it top of C. Or maybe bottom of B. Ugh, I'm trying to be so strict with myself, so because I'm- ugh, I, it feels bad to see uh, Sword of Destiny and the Lady of the Lake in C tier. It just, it hurts my soul. This brings me to the Witcher video game. The first Witcher game basically explores this concept of the influence that we have on the people around us and how that influence shapes people for better or for worse. If you just play it without really thinking about it, you will miss it. The final reveal is just heartbreaking. It is very dated, so I will rank this as the lowest of the three games, but I do know that they are remastering it, and depending on how the remaster goes, and I'm very, very hopeful for it, I think it could rise through the ranks. Unfortunately, I do have to put it in between the two books in C tier. Ah, uh, and again, that hurts my soul, but what can you do? Then we get to Assassins of Kings, and Assassins of Kings does a lot with the Lodge of Sorceresses, so perhaps I am a little bit biased because I love the Lodge. The stuff that is done with Philippa, other than creating my favorite meme of all time. Triss, 
Stop thinking with your vagina and get a hold of yourself. Actually, two memes, two memes. My favorite type of magic, lesbomancy. We get to know Sheila so much better. We get to see Azira Varana Heed. And also a lot of new characters are introduced that are very memorable, like Letho, Yorveth, even though he is like name dropped in the book series, he, he's not really that important, but it, he's really a standout character as well as Roach. Uh, Roach is, oh, love him. He's such a bro. He's such a bro. Who are you? I'm a witcher. M.E.F.R. Embrice, spice merchant. A trader. In spices. Uh-huh. It, it's quite the small game in terms of like scope and storytelling, but it's because it has that replay value of depending which faction you choose to align yourself with, you get to play a substantially different game. And because of that, I will be putting it in middle of B. Okay, because I hate Triss. <laughs> I know this is really petty. I I hate Triss. I hate Triss. Oh, but it has the memes and Philippa. <laughs> this is so hard. <laughs> I'm balancing out my love for Philippa, uh, the branching of the storyline with my hatred for Triss and the smaller scope of the game. Then we get to the masterpiece that is The Witcher 3 The Wild Hunt. I love this game. Did I develop a Gwent addiction? Yes, but does it even need to be said? Is, does, is anyone in doubt of where is this going? And it's going straight to top of S tier. It is maybe my favorite video game. Yeah, no, yeah, it is my favorite video game, I think. I have so much respect for the video games and I'll tell you why, this is my take. The point of the Witcher books is kind of to subvert a lot of typical fantasy notions. Uh, Sapkowski wanted to make Yennefer like the anti-stereotypical love interest. He wanted to make Geralt the very reluctant hero, anti-hero kind of dude, uh, which now is a much more popular trope, but at the time in Poland during communism. We didn't really see that here. And he also wanted to subvert the idea of the prophecy. In the books, the point of them is that we never see it fulfilled. Uh, in fact, the ending of The Lady of the Lake, it leaves so many plots open. It's almost as if he was setting up stuff for another book at the very end that we never saw. And that's a reason why I think some people get really annoyed at that book because it just feels unfinished despite being so long and having so much fluff in it. But that is kind of the point. It's He's trying to show us that the world goes on. This isn't just a stage for this story. What the Witcher games did was they said, okay, we have all these plot points. Let's pick them up and let's write the ending. Does this retcon a few things from the books? Yes but I'm totally okay with it because I feel like the way the retcons are explained is mostly logical. And with adaptations, I think you need to do three things. And this is for all adaptations. Firstly, you need to love the source material. You need to treat it as your Bible. Secondly, you need to understand why other people love it so you know what to focus on when adapting it. And thirdly, you actually need to be good at working in the medium you're changing the source material into, whether it be a TV show or a video game. Said the project, oh, they did those three things perfectly. Some people will argue that the fact that they do offer a conclusion to the prophecy in uh, The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt, that that goes against the soul of the books and the vision of, oh, the prophecies don't matter. I see the point. However, they did it very well. The stuff that they do at the end of the main storyline is, even though the fight isn't the best and, you know, the, you know, the wild hunt is truly nerfed a lot and I know there were like some problems in development at the very end, so a lot of stuff with the wild hunt was cut. That insular storyline of Geralt and Ciri and Yennefer still has such a gorgeous, gorgeous conclusion. And as you see, I'm ranking this video game above all the books, so it it is the best part of The Witcher in my opinion. I can't fault a video game for retconning the books if it does The Witcher better than the books. You know what I mean? Um, as you can see, I still have two tiers left to fill. 
Um, so let's <laughs> let's fill them, shall we? <laughs> Season one. Initially, I wanted to love it so much. I wasn't anywhere as harsh on it as most people were, and you know, I was trying to defend it. My opinion soured on it a lot because of what happened afterwards. I feel like it tainted my initial experience of season one. But I recently had a conversation with some people in the Tutu Ramble server, and they said that that they did enjoy the first season of The Witcher, and I was quite shocked. But they gave me the perspective of, you know, people that didn't read the books, weren't invested in the video games, and they said that they loved the choreography and Henry Cavill's performance. Even though just the script that was written from him, for him um, depicting Geralt was quite different than the Geralt we see in the books, who is very philosophical, he loves to talk. The Witcher TV show we get. <laughs> I did appreciate the new the Yennefer episode. I thought they were setting and foreshadowing a few things later down the line with characters related to her and kind of showing how her story will mirror their stories later on. And I thought it was quite clever, even though they did change some fundamental things like the fact that she actually came from a rich family, not a very poor one. I really had so much hope. I was kind of sad that the visuals just made it seem like any other stereotypical medieval setting. When in reality, like, we could have had so many Slavic influences. Like for the video game, the developers traveled to all places, to all different places in Poland, took pictures, and they were very inspired by architecture. For example, actually, the outfit that I'm wearing is inspired by the mountainous region in Poland and the buildings found uh, outside of Novigrad in the video game are actually inspired by that area as well. And so you could really feel the, the Polish influence. It would have been much more of a standout. And then we get to season two, which truly killed something in me. It flew in the face of everything I loved about The Witcher. The character assassination in this series is so lethal. There are storylines that are added because the writers thought that they could do a better job than the original author. We have Yennefer attempting to kill Ciri, and I think that was the final straw. Why are we doing that? We're doing it just for the money because you want to lure the fans in and say, oh, it's book accurate. It's not book accurate. It's easier to point out what stayed the same than what was changed when talking about season two. It's, it flies in the face of everything. It is very rarely that I wish something was not made because of like the harm that it does to something that I love. And I think that season two of The Witcher, I wish it was never made. And then we get to season three and they try to save things. Definitely better than season two. There are three major problems though. The first major problem is that a lot of the season is spent trying to fix what the previous two seasons, especially season two, destroyed. You can't come back from some of these things. The second major problem is for every step they do to fix the season, they take three steps backwards. I don't know, but sometimes it just feels like they're doing it to piss off the fans. For example, why are we taking Radovid, who is supposed to be a child, and making him much older and really stupid? You're doing it because he is a very iconic character in the video games. What narrative purpose uh, could he serve? Oh, obviously, uh, to get with Dandelion, who is now gay for some reason. And we're going to spend time developing this nonsensical story when you have another character who is becoming a main character. She's stepping into the limelight and she is bisexual. And a very important part of her story in her next season or seasons is going to be the relationship that she develops because of it. It's going to be front and center, very important. In fact, you have introduced her love interest already. Don't you think, as a showrunner who apparently read the books, you know that the way this relationship starts is very problematic. Hint, it involves two grapes. So keeping this in mind that you have this character who needs this development and you have this scene that you really need to uh, work around because you just, you can't put that on Netflix. Why are we making Dandelion gay and taking time away from developing Siri? Why aren't we spending time with her and her love interest having some, you know, witty banter, uh, longing looks, whatever, some chemistry there? Why aren't we doing that? And the third problem is that we don't care about any of the peripheral characters or we should care about the state of the world when it comes to the Kuantanet. Also, it's very important to not have a bias to any of these groups. 
The showrunners really want us to be biased for and against certain groups. That goes against one of the core fundamentals of the series. So the final big moment, the Kuantanad, doesn't work either. Because they do try to fix some things, and its biggest crimes are nowhere near as big as the crimes of season two, I will put season three in D tier, but it's it's not even The Witcher. Again, it's uh, it's easier to point out what they kept the same. Anyways, thank you so much for watching till the end of this video. As you can see, I get quite passionate about this series. It is so dear to me. I highly, highly recommend that you do give it a shot, but that you have the proper expectations when going in and that you are aware kind of of the problems with the translation. Uh, that being said, you know what doesn't have problems with translation and it is the best part of it all, the video game. So I do highly, highly, highly recommend that you do play The Witcher 3 The Wild Hunt because it is fantastic. That's all from me, but I do have this idea for a video where I basically say how I would have adapted the first season into Netflix. And so I'm thinking that I'll film that video and I'll release it around the time that uh, the fourth season comes out for algorithm purposes. Another Witcher video that's going to be coming from me when season four comes out is going to be me uh, reading, rereading the entire series. And for the first time reading season of Storms, which I have just here, uh, because since I don't live in Poland anymore, well, now I am in Poland, but most of the time I don't live in Poland, um, I kind of been keeping Season of Storms for when I feel homesick, and I haven't felt that yet, But so I'm deciding to just bite the bullet and uh, read it this summer. And in the meantime, I wish you happy reading, and I'll see you soon. Bye bye